Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the, we're on episode 14, Sam? 14? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 14. It's yes, double it digits. Is, welcome is, to the know, double digits yeah. adventures of the PEM podcast, Psychic Guy Mystery Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria Lori, with my fabulous sister, Sandy. Um, and we've got a, we've got a, we've got a really interesting mystery this week. Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think this is, even before we get to it, this was the one that, um, I don't know that I pulled a ton of information about it. It was just sort of like giving to me, like, this is how it is. Yeah. And, um, not a lot of extra details. Um, but there was one or one or two that I thought was really interesting. So we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, anecdotes, right? Anecdotes. Um, I, my calendar is so full. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Everybody who listens, who's, uh, signed up for, um, uh, a session. We've been having a you know lot what? of fun. I'm going to, I'm going to lodge a complaint because it's taking away from me time. I'm just saying <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> I'm getting frustrated. <laughs> yeah. I don't have enough time to talk to hands anymore. Um, on a daily basis, we're lucky if we get like what three days a week or something like that. Now it's not even that generous. Trust oh, me. Oh, please whatever. And then I added the class in last week too. So like yeah. there's even less time. So yeah. Yeah. Just kind of, you know, rolling dervish as we go. A couple of weeks I'll be in Hawaii and we can just talk every day. I will not be chatting with you while you're in Hawaii. <laughs> I can send you no. photos of yeah. beautiful Hawaii. Delete, delete, <laughs> delete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. So anecdote this week, um, I thought was, uh, I love it when they show me stuff and they combine it with sort of a pop culture kind of thing. So I was reading for, um, a woman who's a big fan of the, po um, the podcast, lovely, 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 uh, woman. One of 10. <laughs> hmm? One of 10. Shut One up. of 10. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, we, we, we have a budding fan base in the triple digits. <laughs> Someday, maybe we'll get into the four digits. Um, oh, whatever. They're lovely. Our fans are lovely. Anyway. Love um, them all. Huh? Love them all. Yes, exactly. Yes. So um, I was reading for uh, this woman, really, really just a cool human being. And um, her brother had passed over. <clears throat> she wanted me to try and reach out to him. So I did. And um, <laughs> all I heard in my head was, <laughs> Get your motor running, -da 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 -da, head out on the highway, -da 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 -da, looking for adventure. In whatever comes your way. <laughs> Come on, born to be wild with me. Born to be wild. Anyway, so I hear this in my head. And um, and, and I, now we I, all hear it for our own <laughs> listening pleasure. <laughs> but like more in key in my head yeah. than what came yeah. out of my mouth. And, um, and I feel like, um, or I, I saw this like leather, leather jacket. And, um, so I, I asked her, I'm like, did your brother love motorcycles? And she just like started laughing and she's like, he was total biker dude, total hmm. biker dude. That's so funny. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, <laughs> I thought it was so cute that he put the song, uh, born to be wild, uh, in my mind. And now all week I've been, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, you were definitely born to be wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I dress in leather when I'm not in camera. <laughs> <laughs> I just put on my cat suit. With, there um, you go. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know who this is anymore, but okay. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, nothing's more attractive than a 55 year old <laughs> leather clad cat suit wearing woman. <laughs> Who's, well, if you're Halle Berry, maybe yes. born to be wild. Yeah. Okay, well that's true. Yeah. yeah, that kind of puts it over the edge. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Anyway, okay. So that was um, that was the cool anecdote of the week. I had a, I had a couple others, but um, probably will have to dig in because um, you know when I read that I, I read for people unless something kind of unusual happens, I, it's out of my head. I don't even remember it. Um, so um, anyway. Um, that's the anecdote of the week. We'll try and come up with a couple for next week, but um, book promotion time. So this is the third book in the um, Life, Coast, Life Coach Mystery Series, Coached in the Act. 
And it's apropos for today because as you can see the victim, well, listening audience can't see. They must really get frustrated when I'm like, and, and Sandy's facial expressions, you know, like, and they're like, I feel like I'm missing something. And I will tell you, you are, you absolutely are. Come for the podcast to stay for the expression. Ears of a clown. That's what and I'm the eye shutting. Rolls. Ears of a clown. Um, anyway, so um, Coach in the Act has Gilly and Kat um, attending a one woman act um, that is uh, called 12 Angry Men. And the star of the show has basically slept herself all the way around East Hampton and has dirt to share on all of her lovers. So um, Kel Surprise, she is found stabbed to death backstage um, and uh, the plot thickens. Um, so Kat and Gilly are on the case. The Keystone cops are on the case um, and uh, they are trying to sort out um, who killed her and someone else. This is, a, this is one of those times where like you would call me and say, how's the book coming? And I would say something like, I just need another body like I just need another murder. <laughs> and then I hang up. <laughs> she doesn't ever, she never hangs up. She threatens to, but she doesn't. She stays on the line. Sometimes it's just quiet breathing um, on the other end of the phone as I'm cracking myself up. But anyway, so what are you going to do? <laughs> Sisterly love. Sisterly love. Sisterly love. Yeah. Okay. So let's get to um, the murder of Betsy Bart's mom. Um, take it away, Sands. You did a great job on this one too. By the Thank way. you. You do a good job on all of them. <clears throat> all right. Well, um, Betsy was a Penn State graduate student and uh, she was murdered over 50 years ago and no one to this day has ever been uh, arrested or even, um, no one's been arrested or uh, convicted of, of the crime. And it was a very unusual situation and an unusual circumstance. So let me get into it. So Elizabeth Ruth Ardsma, as, as she was known as Betsy, was born in Holland, Michigan on July 11th, 1947, the second of four children to Esther and Richard Ardsma. She was raised in a middle-class religious conservative household and had career ambitions that exceeded those of her homemaker mother. So after graduating from high school, Betsy enrolled in Hope College in the fall of 1965 and wanted to pursue a career as a physician. After two years at Hope College, Betsy transferred to the University of Michigan to study art and English and took up a residence in an apartment with three other female coets. <clears throat> By her senior year, this intelligent, empathic woman with feminist traits had attracted the attention of med student David Wright, who by all accounts was Betsy's first serious boyfriend. In the summer of 1969, after graduating with honors from college, Betsy made plans to join the Peace Corps and travel to Africa. But when she realized that her relationship with David might not survive at a long distance, she opted instead to enroll in Penn State's English master's program and entered in October of 1969 after the semester had started, primarily so she could be closer to David, who was now studying at Penn State College of Medicine in Hershey. The 22-year-old petite attractive co-ed took up residence on the State College campus in Atherton Hall, but rarely spent time there with her roommate, Sharon Brandt, as she was busy studying or on the weekends traveling to the Hershey campus to be with David. By Thanksgiving, Betsy had become highly stressed as she'd fallen behind on a critical English assignment and made plans to meet with her professor on the Friday holiday for advice on her research paper. She spent the day prior to Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving day with David and his roommates and their girlfriends. And then on Friday, she had David drop her off at a bus stop in Harrisburg so she could take a bus back to State College to focus on her paper and attend a meeting that she'd scheduled with the professor. That afternoon, Betsy dressed in a red sleeveless dress with a white turtleneck sweater under it, and her roommate Sharon left Atherton Hall together so that Betsy could visit Patty Library to obtain some critical research material for her English paper. En route, the two parted ways after making plans to get together later that evening to go to the movies to see either Easy Rider or take the money and run. At about I mean, four, come on, right? Like the mystery that, that we do this week coupled with the um, the brother, right? The same song. Like this is the thing, I'm interrupting for just a minute. This is the thing that I absolutely love about this mediumship stuff is that there's there are these multiple layers that um, have absolutely no connection separately um, or you think there's no way that can connect to that. And then they do, they overlap. Um, 
in so many ways, this comes up over and over and over again. And I think the more that you're kind of aware of quote unquote spirit, you know, um, people on the other side who are kind of um, invested in our lives, the more that these quote unquote coincidences, like freakishly specific coincidences start to happen. So well, I think they're, they're signs that you're recognizing right? a pattern or a, a similar right? but sign. Like it's, yeah. it's the stuff that's so uniquely like, where did that come from? Right. Mm -hmm. um, did, I hadn't read this at all. Um, I haven't read most of, the, most of the ones you've written up and sent to me. <laughs> Actually, I, I only read them about, you know, I'm, this was me in college too. I would read, I would study, I would cram before the exam and I always did well, but like week out, no. Mm -mm. Um, but anyway, like, it's just so weird that this woman books this, the, that particular day, asks about her brother, brother comes through with that particular song and it's incorporated into our mystery. It's almost like a confirmation, you know, like you really did hit that. You know, that's how I'm taking it. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm beautiful mining this sands. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to get this out is... the red yarn and the, and the, and the pins. <laughs> Thank you for coming back after our commercial break. Of this <laughs> we haven't sponsored anything in a while either. Okay. I'm... Listen, I'm going to finish this mystery. Oh, yeah. Stop talking back to Betsy. All right, so at about four in the afternoon, Betsy talked with Professor Nicholas Juvosky to get some input on her research paper. And during their conversation, Betsy mentioned that she had planned to head to the library and visit an area uh, that students called the Stacks. And it was named because it was a cramped, isolated center portion of the library with long rows of books and low ceilings. Along her way, she encountered two friends, Linda Marsa and Robert Steinberg. And after a brief, brief chat, she entered the library. She placed her purse, jacket, and book inside a carousel that had been assigned to her and then headed towards the card catalog. At about 4.30 p.m. after finding the reference she needed, Betsy walked down a flight of stairs on the massive structure into the level two core stacks. Just after 4.30 that afternoon, Assistant Supervisor Dean Brungart spotted a girl in a red dress standing alone in an aisle and then in a nearby aisle closer to the west end of the core observed two young men talking quietly among themselves. Approximately 10 minutes later, another witness, Richard Allen, while operating a photocopier, overheard a conversation between a male and a female in the general direction of where Bessie stood, but he could not hear their conversation and he didn't sense that anything was untoward. Sometime just before 45 p.m., between rows 50 and 51, Betsy collapsed, pulling books from adjacent selves on top of herself as she fell onto her back. Some people in the library thought they heard a scream and others only heard falling books. Richard Allen heard a metallic crashing noise and then encountered a young man who looked like a student run barreling past him. Two, two students, Zhao Uofinda and Marley Erdley, then observed a man running from the direction of the commotion, concealing his right hand and yelling, that girl needs help. This man, Zhao, described as six foot tall, 185 pounds with brown hair and glasses, wearing khakis, a tie, and a sports jacket. And then, and then he led Zhao and Marilee into the core stacks where he pointed to Betsy's prone body lying among the scattered books. As Marilee began to help Betsy, Zhao observed the man attempt to quietly leave the area. Suspicious, Zhao discreetly followed the man upstairs and then witnessed him run out of the library. Zhao attempted to give chase, but was outpaced as he watched the stranger run in the direction of Recreation Hall. When Betsy was first discovered, her fellow students initially thought she'd either fainted, experienced a seizure, or suffered some other non-critical ailment. Student paramedics were summoned at 5.01 p.m., and while performing CPR, Betsy was placed on a gurney and taken via ambulance to the campus medical center. It wasn't until Betsy's red dress was removed and her blood-soaked sweater and bra were cut away from her body that a doctor discovered a knife wound and a deep bruising around the entry point. Betsy had been stabbed and the bruising indicated that the assailant had struck her with great force. Betsy was pronounced dead at 5.19 p.m. An autopsy was performed almost immediately after her death and revealed that she had been killed by a single stab wound which had penetrated her best breastbone, pierced her heart, and severed her pulmonary artery, causing extensive hemorrhaging into her chest cavity. Betsy would have been unable to scream while being assaulted, and her death had occurred within five minutes of being stabbed. The coroner opined his belief that Betsy's murderer had intentionally aimed for her heart when he stabbed her while facing her, and that her assailant was a right-handed individual. 35 Pennsylvania State Police were assigned to investigate Betsy's murder, and a $25,000 reward was offered in exchange for information leading to an arrest. 
In the weeks following her death, hundreds of students were interviewed and the entire campus was unsuccessfully searched to locate the murder weapon. Investigators discovered that about 90 students had entered or exited the Patti Library between 4.30 and 5 p.m. on that Friday after Thanksgiving, but none of the library visitors interviewed were viable suspects. Unfortunately, the crime scene, sorry, unfortunately, the crime scene was compromised as library staff, believing that Betsy had fainted, restored the area where she, she had been discovered. Still, police were able to recover a series of small, fresh blood droplets matching Betsy's blood type on the staircase leading to the level three core stacks, indicating that her murderer had left the library via that route. Just, despite pleas from the police, the witness who had alerted Zhao and Merrily about Betsy's need for help did not step forward. Two composite drawings of the individual were created, one with the assistance of Zhao and a library desk clerk, and a second with Marilee's input. Only Marilee's identikit image was released to the media. Investigators believe Betsy likely knew her murderer. The area in the stacks where Betsy had stood was very narrow and required that for an individual to pass her, she or her assailant would have had to have turned sideways to get by. Based upon the stab wound, Betsy had been approached from the front and would have ha had to have faced her assailant. Given that she wasn't expected to be on campus on ho a holiday Friday, investigators discounted the idea that Betsy had been stalked. Further, her diary entries did not indicate that she felt reluctant about her relationship prospects with David Wright, and in fact, she had anticipated getting engaged at Christmas. She had no notations about being interested in another suitor or had otherwise felt intimidated or uncomfortable during the eight weeks she had been enrolled at Penn State. Another theory that investigators considered was the possibility that Betsy had stumbled upon a homosexual encounter and may have recognized one or both male participants and had been murdered to ensure her silence. This theory was given, given credence by the investigator, Michael Much, who noted that in a section of the core, uh, who noted that in a section of the core, it was used to store desks and spare shelving. And there was a desktop with a seat pulled back and it contained a half empty can of soda and a small stack of pornographic ma magazines. Furthermore, more than two dozen pornographic magazines were found concealed between books in the aisles where Betsy had been murdered and ample traces of semen were discovered in multiple locations leading investigators to conclude that this secluded area of the stacks was regularly used to conduct illicit sexual encounters. Although partial fingerprints were obtained from a soda can, the prints did not match any within the police database, and all fingerprints upon and within the magazines were smudged and unusable. Though their invest through their investigation, police had three persons of interest in the murder of Betsy. The first was William Spencer, who was a 40-year-old sculptor who had recently re located to Pennsylvania with his second wife in support of her PhD studies at Penn State. Uh, and he claimed that at a holiday party, he had killed that girl in the library. According to Spencer, he became acquainted with Betsy when she had agreed to pose nude for his sculpting class to earn extra money. Spencer had been in the level two core stacks at the time of her murder and claimed he had seen the murderer. Police quickly dismissed Spencer's claims as Betsy's interest in posing as a nude model were never corroborated and Betsy was known to be kind of a prudish young woman. The second suspect was a fellow classmate, Larry Maurer, who initially aroused investigators' suspicions because he and Betsy had formed a friendship a few weeks before her death, which included taking Betsy out for coffee. No ill feeling is known to have existed between the two, and Maurer appears to have been cleared as a potential murder suspect, primarily because he did not fit the description provided by Zhao and Mary Lee, although it isn't publicly known if Maurer passed or failed the polygraph test. The final suspect, Richard Hefner, a then 25-year-old geology student, is believed to be the most likely suspect in the murder of Betsy. Hefner was a well-respected but socially awkward individual known to have taken extreme measures to obtain a platonic relationship with women to conceal his homosexuality and for engaging in erratic behavior, including periodic bouts of explosive anger and stealing several specimens from the university's rock collection uh, and not returning them. Hefner's name had first been mentioned to investigators a few days after Betsy's murder by her roommate, Sharon Brandt, who told police that Hefner had visited their apartment on more than one occasion in the weeks prior to Betsy's death. When questioned by investigators in early December 1969, Hefner freely admitted to having occasionally socialized with Betty beginning in late October, but within one week of their meeting, Betsy terminated their budding friendship because she was committed to David Wright. Hefner further aroused suspicion as he fit the description of the man Zhao and Mary Lee entered, enter, encountered in the library. Hefner frequently wore a sports coat with a khaki trousers and a brown hair in his brown hair short and tidy. Hefner claimed he had been eating an evening meal at the student union building on the evening of November 28th. 
Hefner further claimed that he had never set foot in the Patti Library, and he invariably obtained his research materials from the Dyke Building, where the literature related to, to geology was stored. Despite the circumstantial evidence against Hefner, he was never charged with Betsy's murder. Many believe that he at least knew who murdered Betsy. Hefner went on to become an assistant professor of geology and a renowned lecturer with a doctorate from Penn State University. However, despite his prestigious career, Hefner continued to be surrounded by controversy. In August of 1975, two boys who worked in Hefner's family rock shop would, would separately accuse him of pedophilia. The high profile 1976 trial ended in a hung jury. And thereafter, as a plaintiff, Hefner spent con considerable portion of his two final decades in courtrooms filing lawsuit after lawsuit, some intended to clear his name and others intended to harass his enemies. He died in Las Vegas in 2002 at age 58. Betsy was laid to rest on December 3rd, 1969. Her casket remained open throughout the ceremony prior to her interment. She was buried in her hometown in the family plot with a single rose from her boyfriend David placed in her hands. The final letter Betsy wrote to David had arrived at his address the day after her murder. Notwithstanding the efforts of the Pennsylvania State Police and the president of university, Eric Walker, the case gradually became cold and the number of investigators assigned to the case decreased as potential leads to pursue became increasingly scarce. No individual has ever been arrested for Betsy's murder and her case remains unsolved. Records pertaining to her murder remain sealed under the state's Open Records Act. However, the Pennsylvania State Police are still actively seeking information in the case. My sources for this story included Wikipedia, The Lancaster News, Who Killed Betsy Ardsma, by Gil Smart, Associate Editor, October 10, 2010, updated September 11, 2013, and the NBC News Cold Case Spotlight, the unsolved murder of Penn State student Betsy Ardsma haunts community 52 years after she was stabbed in the library stacks by Andrea Cavalier, November 28, 2021. So what do you think mm -hmm. happened, Victoria? Um, well, I, I um, want to throw out all three suspects. First of all, um, none of them like clicked for me. Uh, none of the um, suspects, none of the men um, rang a bell of truth as to uh, committing this crime. So um, <clears throat> I'm assuming um, that the one that sparked the most interest, Richard Hepner, um, his photo was probably circulated to the two eyewitnesses, correct? I'm assuming, right? Like, why wouldn't yes. it be? Um, well, those two eyewitnesses actually were the ones that came up with a composite that looked like him. Mm -hmm. And then the police made the connection between the composite that Zhao had given with mm -hmm. uh, Richard Hefner. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm a if I'm a police investigator, I'm going to follow that up and take mm -hmm. actual an actual kind of mugshot or an actual photo of him to them and go okay it, within a cluster of other yeah. photos and be like pick out who you saw. Um, mm -hmm. I just I just really don't think he was there or had anything to do with it. Did he know who did it? I think he suspected. Um, so <clears throat> um, when I did the automatic writing, trying to find out what happened to Betsy, um, I was uh, pretty much told that there was a young man who would go to that particular library, wasn't actually a student, but he could pass for a student. Um, and that's where he would um, solicit sex for money in exchange for money. Um, and it was kind of a little bit of a, gold mine for him. He could always kind of count on someone being there. Um, I was further kind of um, <clears throat> sent in the direction of, of thinking that he um, lived on the streets more than he lived in a home or a house. And he modeled himself, interestingly, after James Dean. So he was a fairly good looking guy. I didn't get the feeling that he was tall. I got the feeling that he was a little on the shorter side. Um, I would have put him at maybe five seven, five eight is sort of the sense that I had. Um, and they, <clears throat> um, uh, my source from the other side um, uh, suggested that um, he had blonde hair, um, like very light blonde hair and um, light eyes. Um, I think that the man who fled the scene was who was the um, patron. <laughs> Part participant. Yeah, participant um, in the in the act. And um, Betsy, I think, came upon what was going on and um, might have recognized um, who the other gentleman was. We don't know. Um, 
And because the space was so tight, I believe that she was blocked from getting out and then she was stabbed. So um, I don't know that that um, the, the death blow was necessarily meant to be precise. I kind of think it was, they were um, just the convenience of height where he thrust the knife and she was petite and it just ended up um, uh, piercing the breastbone. And I believe this young man, because he spent more time on the streets than he did in a house and did this for a living, um, was basically a prostitute um, for his living. He knew how to carry a knife and he knew how to wield it probably because he had to, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. why else bring a dagger or a knife into a library? Right. If you're yeah, piercing... self-defense for self-defense for himself, if he got into trouble, obviously, right, right. but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about, um, why would a student, right. Yeah. Why would a student bring a knife into a library? <clears throat> and she, um, there was nothing in her diary that indicated that she had any issues with anybody else. Um, as far as calling off her friendship with Hepner, um, I think she could just start to get a creepy vibe from him. Um, and, you know, I, I assume he probably was a pretty creepy dude um, to be accused separately of pedophilia from two men. I do feel that there were people who knew who murdered Betsy or, or highly suspected um, that they knew who, who murdered her, mostly because they had probably been patrons of this young man. Um, <clears throat> when I asked about the aftermath of what happened to him, <clears throat> my sense was that he left Philadelphia and headed east to New York and settled in New York City and then um, was kind of always looking over his back, um, over his shoulder, excuse me, um, thinking about the, this murder. Um, and um, I don't think he'd ever murdered anybody before or murdered anybody afterward. And it finally caught up to him because uh, my crew from the other side basically said he did himself in. So I think that he committed suicide um, at some point when he was still fairly young. I would have still put him in his 20s when he did this. And they said, you know, the mystery will never be solved. Um, and it, it's been 52 years and there's zero to go on. So probably true, you know, but that's that's my feeling. That's uh, That's what I think happened. I just, so you I, don't think Richard, you don't think Richard Hefner was in the library at the time I don't. of he was really don't. Okay. Yeah. I just don't because <clears throat> even though he was similar to the sketch, um, if I'm a cop and you know, and I've been burglarized before and, um, I knew who did it and they brought, um, what is it? Um, a, it's like a cluster. I can't even think of what it is. Mug, mug shots. Yeah, yeah they're mugshots, of, like it's a it's profile. Like, it's like a lineup of of, of people. Of exactly, suspects. exactly in photos, right? And they were like, mm -hmm. "Okay, pick out, you know, who you saw rob you." And I'm like, "That person." So, mm -hmm. um, and they all kind of look similar, right? They try and find mm -hmm. people that look similar, so that so that there's no doubt that you recognize um, right. who committed that act. And I just can't see them, even though we don't have. Um, a, de a definitive say in it on, on the police investigation, I just cannot see them not following up with these two eyewitnesses and saying, we suspect Hefner, is this the guy, you know? So they couldn't pick him out of the alignment, a, a lineup. And when they saw Betsy and they had a really good, he led them to her, right? He led them yeah. to her. I think that he was a patron. I don't think he committed the act. Um, concealing his right hand, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't buy it. Um, it. If he stabbed her in the heart, that, that knife is covered in blood. It's not like he can yeah. conceal it. Right. And if it penetrated the breastbone, that's a knife. That's a, like a switchblade. That's probably a six inch blade to go in and sever the aorta, right. To mm -hmm, pierce mm -hmm. the breastbone and sever the aorta. That's a, that's a long blade. So how are you going to seal that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's covered in blood. Um, they would have noticed. I feel like they would have noticed um, something. So well, I, I think, think I think that the two went in opposite directions. Opposite directions, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the murderer went went up. Okay, level, so to level, level three, where her blood was found. Exactly, right. and but yeah. on level two is the exit, correct? Or level one is the exit? Level one is the exit. Okay, so where I was she? No, level. 
sorry. Every, everything I've read was she went down she into went the. So there was a lower level the from the. From I think the three was. I think three was the top level. Right. And then two. They say they went up to three, and then two, and then one. Right. So maybe the exit was on level three. I'm not uh, sure. I, yeah. I don't, I didn't go to Penn state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe someone out there can give us a detail of the library, but if, I feel like <clears throat> he went up one more floor, waited until, mm -hmm. um, you know, probably hit out in the library because it would have been suspicious if he had run out the door and, and run across campus. Right. More witnesses. Yeah, agreed. And I think that the guy that he was quote unquote servicing, um, was trying to call attention to what had happened. I think he probably was um, totally shocked. Um, yeah. By what? By what happened? Right. Yeah. Um, and um, tried to exit stage left because he certainly didn't want to be implicated um, in her murder um, or what he was doing there at the time. Like, wasn't homosexuality um, in 1968 nine? Wasn't that like illegal? I know it was illegal in a lot of places. Um, yeah, I, I would assume it was either illegal or, or very much frowned upon still. So, yeah. and the stigma um, would have the been way, enormous. Yeah, not worth coming forward for. Right. Um, right. So it said the, the crime scene, Betsy fainted. Um, police were able to recover a series of small fresh blood dro droplets that matched Betsy's blood on, on the staircase leading to level three core stacks, indicating that the, her murderer had left the library via this route. So I think one is the bottom, two is middle, three is like top level, level. and then you're out. Yeah, and then okay. you're out. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, just don't get it that but, it was Hefner. It just doesn't, to me, it just doesn't ring that bell of truth. Like I, I would have loved to it, um, to have pointed to him and been like, there he is, that, that guy did it. It just mm -hmm. doesn't, just doesn't ring true. And I think that's why he was never arrested um, because um, the eyewitnesses couldn't ID him. And they had a really good look at him. Yeah. They were standing next to him um, for yeah. a period. He led them to her. And in those instances, when your adrenaline is running high, your memory kind of cements itself. Um, so, you know, that's the problem with people who um, later on experience P PTSD. Their adrenaline forces the brain to capture that moment, <clears throat> um, which is a <clears throat> uh, survival um, instinct that's, you know, as old as we are. So um, I just, I don't get Hefner as it. And I don't even get that he was at the scene. I just don't believe he was there. I, be I believe that he was probably eating a meal in the student union. So that's, that's my feeling. If you disagree with it, that's fine. That's okay. You don't have to get mad at us. <laughs> Oh God, they came out, didn't they? The wolves came out last it's week. It's okay. Yeah. Look, I it's a it's is, this is for entertainment purposes only. Uh, you know, I think only. I think your intuition is uh, <clears throat> really exciting to understand what you perceive and how you get your information. And I think time and again, you give very sound logical reasons as to how it happened in addition to the, your intuition kind of guiding the solution. So right. I'm sorry that Betsy's murder will never be solved. Um, she seemed, she seemed like she had a really nice life going for her and had a lot right? of promise. So yeah, and it's the, very the, sad. The, the really sad part was that she, if she just joined the Peace Corps, she probably would have lived, you know, to be a little old lady, she probably would still be alive today. Um, but you know, dropped it all, dropped her ambitions to be a doctor. Even it sounds like, yeah, um, she did for the guy. Yeah. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> live your life, live your full, complete life. <clears throat> don't drop everything okay. for a partner. Well, we're talking 52 years ago. So in I know, those days, I know, but it's still, it's a time, it's still a Sarkin. good lesson, right? It's still a good lesson. Don't do that. Um, you'll regret it. Um, more, more than likely. not necessarily. <laughs> yes, necessarily. Not necessarily. Some people can get you know fall in love and move forward with each other with one right. another. See, but... if it's a true partnership, if if it's a true partnership where both support each other, why did she drop out of med school? Why wasn't why wasn't he supportive of her dreams? 
Why didn't he know. support her going to the Peace Corps? Why didn't he support her, you know, going to med school? Like, that's my whole I don't point. Know. Don't drop your dreams to support someone else's before you're even committed or married or have children. That's my whole point. Women. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Girls, so um, moving on to next week's podcast, I just want to let everyone know that the um, murder, the mystery we're going to focus on is the murder of the Walker family. It is a very graphic, um, mystery. And I just want to warn everyone definitely tune in, but it is, it is probably the most graphic case that we'll present having up until now. And hopefully not again for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, Sandy, uh, precursed sending me over the write-up <clears throat> yesterday with letting me know exactly kind of in very soft terms, what happened just to make sure that I'm not, we don't have another instance where, um, uh, I'm kind of traumatized <laughs> tuning into what happened. Um, so I'll take a look and we'll talk about the walkers next week. Yes. So anyway, all right, everybody, it was lovely chatting at you, with you, about you. Um, and Sans, um, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your weekend. I love you so much. Thank you for doing this as always. Yeah, and thanks for reading it at the last minute. I really appreciate it. That's yeah, great. Yeah, you know, very yeah. excited. It still resulted in the same, it's still, it's, I still got some stuff. Yes, you did, which is great. I'll just, I'll just you know, I will treat you like I do my agent and my editor. Oh, joy. oh gosh, I'm almost done with that. What? I'm almost done with that when I haven't even started it. So see, but the thing is, is I know that's how you operate. So well, they saying. do too, but it makes them feel better when I lie to them. It does not make me feel better when you <laughs> lie to me. Let's be clear. And on that happy note, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And thank you for tuning in. And we'll look forward to next week when we um, tackle yet another unsolved mystery. Um, podcast. If you want to know more about me, or book an appointment with me, book a session with me, please go to victorialaurie.com um, and click on um, book your psychic session now. Um, spaces are filling up. Uh, so yeah. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye, Sans. Love you. Love you too. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.